Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit further of examples of this topic about not limiting your training tools. And what I tried to say in the last video is that look, if you see very successful coaches and very successful athletes incorporating certain tools or certain methods, it's good to be open-minded about those things. It doesn't mean you have to automatically accept those things. It doesn't mean you have to be so open-minded that your brain falls out. But there comes a point when something does seem to be working very, very well for some coaches, really good coaches, respected coaches, world-class level lifters and athletes. It's at least worth looking at and saying, okay, what in the heck are they doing? Is this, is this a fluke that this is working, or is there something to it? Okay? And you don't outright object, reject it, especially just because someone else debunks it. Okay, that's a real bad idea. Just because someone debunks it and makes a good argument against it, well, if it seems to do what their argument claims it won't do, then you can reject their argument automatically. Any, any argument of logic can be thrown out with evidence. In other words, perfect example, the box squat. Someone says the box squat doesn't carry over to the raw squat. Well, it's provable, and there are plenty of athletes, myself included, who've proven that it 100% does. That isn't even in question. It is so easily provable that I would consider it to be an absolute fact based on my life experience replicating it multiple times. You'd have a hell of a time convincing me that it doesn't because I've seen pretty definitive evidence. So your argument of logic against my actual evidence is garbage. We can throw that argument in the trash. Okay, that's an example of what I mean there. But we don't just accept an argument against something when it clearly works. Maybe you should figure out why it works. Right? And if maybe it works in a special circumstance, it doesn't meet your circumstance or that of your athletes or your lifters, by all means. Say, well, I don't, I don't know that it's the right tool for me. Nothing wrong with that. You were you at least examined it. And it's an option on the table in the future if that situation opens. If you have the situation open where it does seem to be beneficial, comes up, hey, you have another tool available. Great. But examples of what I'm talking about, guys who say stuff like, I only do calisthenic movements. I want to be a calisthenic athlete. Which just sounds ri ridiculous. Because, you know what? Barbell athletes do more than barbell training. Okay? The calisthenic athletes need to remember that. So if all you do is calisthenics because you want to be a calisthenic athlete, you're probably stupid. And actually, I think calisthenics are pretty good. Like, I think they're actually a very valuable training tool. Right? Obviously, they are. You can look at what's going on biomechanically and say, yeah, those are, a lot of those are pretty damn good exercises. They bring a lot to the table. I use a lot of them. A lot of my athletes use a lot of them. Why wouldn't we? Calisthenics are a good tool. Exercises where you're moving your body through space. That, that has a lot of potential. Right, and, and anyone who, who is objective and reasonable and understands training can look at that and say, hey, you know what? Calisthenic movements are very valuable. They are good. They are useful in the context of a larger training program. In fact, a lot of people are having to go through that right now who have nothing but body weight stuff at home. And you know what? Might not maintain a very advanced lifter. But a lot of intermediates out there can maintain on it. And a lot of novices could be making gains doing nothing but calisthenics for a while. They might come back to the gym bigger and stronger. Even after a couple months out, right? Yeah. Maybe their work capacity will be up. Their conditioning will be up. I mean, they're useful tools. Especially when you're in a situation for a while you don't, you don't have access to a lot of equipment. By all means, knock that calisthenic stuff out. Why wouldn't you? It'd be foolish not to use it. So let's come back over to that point. The difference between open-minded is I can see a lot of uses for that tool. I might not even be using it right now, but I can see situations where it would be very useful. I need to keep that option open. Hey, and maybe there are times when I throw some calisthenic stuff in uh, for extra work capacity and stuff on some of my movements. 
inside the context of the rest of my training. See, that's that's being smart about it. That's saying, you know what, they're valuable. I can use that. Being stupid and limiting yourself is to say, I'm going to do nothing but calisthenic movements to get stronger at calisthenics. Well, that's not the way the body works, my friend. That's called being stupidly obsessed with specificity of training. Instead of stepping in and saying, well, some of these calisthenics at these volumes might not give me the best muscle growth to give me the best strength and everything to get better at doing more and more volumes of calisthenics. Maybe I should incorporate some weight movements. Yeah, and maybe I should make sure I do more legs because this stuff sure isn't working. My lower body is leaving me really weak overall. You know, I might have a strong upper body. Maybe some is a little hard on the joints and you need some joint easier stuff to get some extra volume in that will carry over and make you better at your calisthenics, right? Shouldn't be hard to figure out. A lot of times we can get better at our big lifts by adding some calisthenics in the right places, right? It works the other direction too. There are situations where you can get better at some of your calisthenics by incorporating some, some heavy barbell work in there. Might make you better at it. If you're careful in the tools that you pick, if you're smart about it and use some common sense, that's the difference. Understanding that a tool is just a tool, you're not married to it. Let's come back over to the same thing with barbells. I get your guys out there, and I've spent my time period, you know, I've done my time in that jail. Oh, barbell's the only thing I'm going to use. I want to be good at barbell lifts. I'm going to do nothing but barbell work. Yeah, that sounds real cute, doesn't it? The size and strength are size and strength. And barbells are arguably, I would argue that the, you know, the normal barbell, Olympic barbell, is probably the single greatest training tool invented. The loadable, adjustable barbell. Yeah, absolutely. It's revolutionary. Right? It is one of the most revolutionary, possibly the most revolutionary device introduced to training, strength training. It's an indispensable tool. I mean, it's the only thing you should be doing. Not even close. Do you think the only way to get dramatically better at your barbell movements is to do nothing but barbell movement? Look at all the specialty bars I have. You guys think I would have spent a couple thousand dollars on specialty bars if my two straight bars could do everything I needed them to do in a perfect world? No. Of course not. And I have two of them, and they're great, and I use them every single training session. I do normal Olympic or power bar work every single training session. Yeah, right there. You don't think this improves my squats for me to do hip belt squats? You don't think that makes me better at the barbell back squat? I promise you it does. I promise you statistically, for those listening, I understand there are exceptions. These exceptions are going to be less than 1% of people listening. You might be one of them. I bet you I squat more than you. Now before you jump in and say, well, I don't know, man, I squat 475. Yeah, I know I squat more than you then. Maybe you should be doing some of this non-barbell stuff. See how that works? Why don't you do some banded box squats like I do. Do some of these hip belt squats. You should do some glute ham raises. That's a calisthenic movement. One that I happen to really like. It's fantastic. Maybe that'll help you with your squat. Worth considering. There's some, some calisthenics movements you could probably throw in there. Probably help you out. So do you guys see the problem? This is what I mean by limiting tools is to say, I'm going to use this one tool. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to have 37 different tools available to me. And I'm going to use the best ones for any given situation. Because I'm chasing optimal. I want to get the best performance. I want to get the best results. And if I want to get the best results, I need to be optimal. And that might require me to use a lot of tools just to stay injury free as well. Because I promise you guys, overuse injuries are a very real thing. People who limit their tools too much, those are the people who get hurt the most too. 
Because again, overuse injuries are real. Having different tools at your disposal is absurdly helpful for getting around that. And if we can stay uninjured, we don't get hurt, how much more productive are we in our training? All right, if you have to take three weeks off every single year due to injuries, not even regular details, let's say injuries are taking you out of training three weeks, four weeks, five weeks every single year, that's not very productive. You need to learn to diversify your tools, right? We should be chasing optimal. We should be chasing optimal. What's the best tool that I have available to me at this time to use for this specific programming or training need? Right? What will meet my needs the best? Not what would be good, not what's second best, third best, fourth best. What's the best tool I have at my disposal currently? And could I add some more tools to my toolbox to give me more options? Be a wise idea. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.